G'day guys, um, this is a short little video on about somebody's comment that they left on one of my recent videos. I'll just read it out. Um, the person is definitely somebody who's, you know, a Paul Saladino supporter. He sort of left a few previous comments, which I sort of replied, um, trying to make out that there's a number of issues in the carnival community and, you know, Paul was right and everybody owes him an apology. No, Paul isn't right. Nobody owes Paul an apology. Uh, Paul just promotes pseudoscience and nonsense. You know, he, you know, if Paul claims something, show, show us the science, show us the proofs, show us the, you know, the arguments for what you're putting forward. When somebody puts forward a proposition or puts forward a hypothesis or puts forward or claims something, they need to basically be able to show mechanisms of how this actually could work and why it could happen. Like recently they did the Sean Baker um, video and I showed, you know, ways that his blood pressure could have gone blood sugar could have gone up and his testosterone could go, could have gone down. So there is actual clearly identified physiological processes that can take place under certain circumstances. And that's actually, you know, I can back that up and show that that is demonstrable. You can actually do certain types of experiments personally as a person and actually show that that actually is what is happening. But Paul never did that. Paul just basically came up and said, oh, you know, this is happening and it's for this reason and all that. And I'm going, well, one, you're under eating protein. That's a possibility. The other is you could have the genetics um, because he did talk about heart palpitations and other things like that. And I suspect there, you know, people that do paleo or do um, non-dairy uh, carnival and have these genetics at 24%, like myself, we'll know very quickly that, you know, you're not feeling as fantastic. And it's because of the last couple of thousand years adaptation of pastoral populations that have these genetics. And I know that they are prevalent in Greece and in Italy. And he's Italian background and from Southern Italy, which means he's got more Greek, more Greek genetics and they are pastoral genetics. So I would not be surprised if he did a genetic test and found that Paul had these same genetics that I have. And what he's done is he's masked. Remember the video that I did? I'll put it somewhere here as well, that video. Um, that was the one that I did. Um, I think it was my first video that I did with um, Pim Johnson, um, Bart Kay's pa partner. And I actually showed an old study, uh, which it was about the dietary guidelines. And I showed an old study of Walter Kempner, who did the low fat stuff and all that and showed pretty good results, disengagement of the Randall cycle. But one important thing that Walter understood is that when you're on a low-fat diet, what happens is you're able to basically push up insulin sufficiently to hold on to electrolytes. So he supplemented zero electrolytes. And that was deliberate. You know? And so by... Putting some carbs into your diet, like Paul's done, he's masked the problem. Rather than actually resolving the problem because, okay, you can't extract sufficient, um, just from meat, muscle meat, sufficient calcium because of those genetics. So you need to um, incorporate certain um, dairy products to get the sufficient level of calcium to basically mitigate all these things, which affects GLP-1 and a whole lot of other things, pathways in the body. Um, it normalizes sort of heart um, rhythms, um, the way the heart responds. And at the same time, if you eat sufficient protein, you will get uh, improvements in some of these pathways in the body. So that's the other thing. Plus, you'll get a bit more taurine, which will regulate the ions in the system. And so had Paul done some of these things, he would need to be guzzling down all these carbohydrates and trying to justify why he needs carbohydrates. High deuterium foods that we know does cause 
one glycation and two mitochondrial damage over time so over a long period of long stiffness because of my higher um, deuterium in your body in your tissue that will actually cause joint stiffness and other things like that and already if you take a look at his you know um face compared to a couple of years back he looks pretty yeah run down he doesn't look that good fairly glycated i would say so it's completely nonsense and the and the other and the other issue you know people that actually always argue oh you know some some tribal people some you know have uh, eat some honey and first of all i've covered and debunked a lot of that nonsense because it's a very small amount and it's seasonal and the word is seasonal up until we had refrigeration i even remember when i was in greece in the 70s late 70s the only stuff that we saw as fruit as kids at that, that time was seasonal fruit that the farmers brought in from the local um uh, you know region that was it there was nothing being flown in or anything like that because then back then um the costs were prohibitive and there wasn't enough um air transport air transport really boomed um in the 21st century in particular but back then it was basically primarily shipping and you can forget about things lasting very long if they're on a ship. Most fruit was domestic, and that's what you got for about one or two months and pretty much nothing else. And any other stuff was pretty much fermented, preserved in in terms of jams and stuff like that. That's how, you know, if you go back, ask your parents, ask your mothers, uh, ask your grandparents, that's exactly how a lot of that sort of stuff was um, preserved and a lot of plants also were either fermented like uh, gherkins you know little um, little cucumbers because you know they only exist for a short period of time these are seasonal f foods that, that appear and the only way you can actually do is preserve them in a number of different ways so this whole concept of having all year round access to these sort of things is a modern thing and to say that i need this when you're not actually, you know, trying to find the underlying reason, which could be genetic in his case, similar to my, similar to myself, or under eating protein, either one, you know, rather than actually investigating those things that other people more competent in the carnival community pointed out to him, he considered he continued to follow a contraindicated approach, which actually has, in my personal opinion, made his you know look i mean he's younger than me i'm 57 and my face looks a hell of a lot healthier than his face and he's in his 40s so say no more but anyway this guy actually left a comment and said a further comment on the most recent one um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna state who it was um, that's not the purpose of this it's just a because this is anyone could have left this comment um, and it just goes, which is typical sort of the stuff that um, you will find with a Rate Pete fan club, um, uh, people like Paul um, and the likes of people that, you know, need to justify their their sugar, their sugar addictions or incorporation of some foods that they know is contraindicated. I personally do not care what people eat. That's their business. Um, this is not a criticism of how people are eating. If you want to eat high deuterium foods like fruit, go right ahead. It's the worst carbohydrate you could consume, plus the fructose, which has a whole lot of deleterious effects on your mitochondria and on your liver. But beside that, if we put that aside in that regard, what you do to your body is your business, none of my business. All I'm going to do is just call out if somebody actually claims that it's a healthy thing or it's fine or it's justified. And even if you were to say it's justified, it's only justified seasonally because it was not available outside season. It's only modern refrigeration and modern um, hot houses that are allowing it to be produced all year round. And that's a very recent phenomenon. It didn't exist in the past. So that is absolute nonsense to claim that it's a sort of a natural thing to, you know, there's a lot of cyanide is natural. Many other things are natural. But anyway, 
so basically he states that and then he goes to, then he has a number of three point four points the first point why did we develop the hands that we did that's again you know the, to be able, able to pick things well mm -hmm. first of all a whole lot of species have a whole lot of different hands in order to pick things mm -hmm. you know so you don't have to have these type of hands um necessarily you know or opposable thumbs mm -hmm. as one would call them necessarily to pick fruit and be and not and not be a carnivore you can be anything it's irrelevant um why did we develop color vision which was the other one and the, th the third one um why do we have taste buds for sweetness and bitterness and the fourth one why are we able to process alcohol and my sort of replies is all species including humans have vestigial structures and traits as an example the appendix and 12 others that i won't go into that's for another future video to which i'll cover this comprehensively because a lot of this sort of stuff is also, it's not just people like that support uh, that want to justify um, fruit, I mean, uh, and honey in that sort of case. But there are other people in the vagunarized community that want to um, justify plants. And I will cover a lot of these points in a more comprehensive way. This was just a quick rundown on the sort of arguments you can actually use. And I will add this, my, uh, my response in the comment section so anybody can actually use it as polemics out there when you're actually dealing confronting similar nonsense. Okay, so the first point um, I pretty much cover. Countless species have opposable thumbs. So it's not only us humans or the apes, the great apes. Even some marsupials have, you know, like koalas, exactly like those little, they have opposable um, thumbs as well, but, you know, and uh, even some carnivores and plant eaters. So it's there's a lot of species that do have opposable thumbs, not just us humans. Anyway, number two, the only animals confirmed to seem black and white is the skate. That's a fish because it has no cones in its eyes. That's the only one. So... Every other species has um, the ability to see colour at varied levels. And I go, both carnivores and plant eaters have colour vision of varied degrees, including some carnivores with more than other carnivores. And that's true. Some carnivores have more, and even some plant eaters. So there are carnivores out there that have got better colour vision than even plant eaters. And because some, you know, just whatever else, it's their lineage um you know they what their species have, has adapted over a very long period of time but pretty much there is a lot of diversity so anybody can cherry pick anything because there are carnivals that have better um uh, color vision others that have got better night vision others that have got poorer night vision like us midday persistent hunters were adapted for that midday period because we sweat and so we can actually hunt when the cats are not out so we've actually found a niche to um adapted niche um, to hunt so you know and then you've got the um, the other situation where you'll find all sorts of other plant eaters that also have varied color vision capabilities others are quite poor because they just have to differentiate um uh, they only specialize in certain plants and for them they don't have to differentiate too many colors and others mm -hmm. that uh don't need to, you know, um, really work out what's happening in their environment. Where, on the other hand, we need to be able to see details. Why? Because we are a midday persistent hunter. We're not a night hunter. So night vision is better with the cats. They have a poorer, for instance, um, colour vision, where wolves and foxes have better colour vision than the cats because they hunt also in the daytime. So there are differences based on when you're hunting, how you're hunting, all these sort of things are in play. And so there are variations of all sorts for a whole lot of reasons. 
So it is, as I said, so that so that is a ridiculous Mickey Mouse argument. I hear these ignorant arguments constantly from vegans, and I do, because there are so many variations. Anybody can pull any example up. And when you have so many varied variations, it means that it's not specific so that somebody can use that argument. When you find the inverse relationship in anything, you say, well, you can't use that as an argument because it's a you know, it's fallacious. You know, you're bullshitting basically, in a sense, because you know, there are variations in plant eaters, there are variations in carnivore for a whole lot of raft of reasons. So that's absolute nonsense. Then we go down to the other part. Now, I did actually, I didn't cover um, entirely the amylase one. I should have, but I didn't. Um, and there are like dogs and wolves and stuff like that have amylase as well, even though they are pure carnivores. And there are some carnivores that do and some the carnivores that don't. Why? It's probably, you know, their long, their long relationship with probably older species that they've evolved from that, that pretty much may have had those adaptations. There's a lot of, you know, when it comes to amylase, there's a lot of variation. Even amongst humans, tribal people have less amylase, like the sand people and a number of other, um, uh, the, you know, the Bushmen of the Kalahari, uh, the Inuit um, traditionally. But the other thing is that the body is also adaptable. And we do see when an animal eats certain food, even if they contraindicate it, can it upregulate amyloids. We've seen that in populations that eat more plants have express that gene more others that don't express it less so it's quite clearly that it is it's something that can switch on switch off increase or decrease in the amount of expression based on what you're doing so again that's not an argument um, in that regard um, so there are variations even within species for a whole lot of reasons you know so but anyway I sort of cover, I, and I basically say this was because it was more focused on the fruit. We had to cover the genetics. That's important. So for three and four, I said 80, 85 different species have the ADH7 gene to process alcohol because it was about, you know, if you can eat fruit, you can ferment fruit, which means you produce certain amount of alcohol content, you know. So, yeah, you've got to have that gene to be able to deal with both um, fructose and at the same time deal with, you'll be able to deal with alcohol. Anybody that knows from um, some of the research that's been done on the pathways in the liver that actually process fructose, they are the same ones that process alcohol. You know, Lustig is one of the guys that actually done a lot of presentations on that subject, so I won't cover it here because it's not necessary. Um, some plant and I go on and say some plant eaters and some carnivores have lost this gene. So not all of them, you know, so have lost this gene. And that's uh sorry. Oh well, I missed one part. 85 different species have the ADH7 gene to process alcohol, some plant eaters and some carnivores. And some carnivals like dogs, foxes, sea lions, walruses, and us have this gene. So they're all carnivals. Everybody knows that a dog is a carnival. Um, a wolf is a carnival because the wolf is, as well has this gene. I should have included that. Foxes have this. Sea lions are carnivals. They have this gene. Walruses are also carnivals. They have this gene. And we have it as well. So it is nonsense to say, you know, why do these animals, you know, um, I was quite surprised when I found out that sea lions and walruses have this gene. I'm going, this was a while back anyway, I'm going, bloody hell, you know, where do they find alcohol on the ice? So maybe it's a, a long adaptation. I mean, we probably have certain adaptations of the amyloids, for instance, from 10,000 year, ten, sorry, 10 million year common ancestor. So, mm -hmm. but that's for another com another day, another conversation us with this gene while some plant eaters and carnivores have lost this gene so some carnivores don't have this gene and some plant eaters don't have this gene so it's not basically to argue that if you can't if you consume um uh, you know alcohol 
it means that you should be a plant eater. That's nonsense. Absolutely nonsense, because some plant eaters don't have this gene either. They've lost it and uh, don't work and, and won't do very well on alcohol. Then I go, why did some uh, um, carnivores and plant eaters lose this gene? I explain. I suspect it was due to some sort of required adaptation. There would have been an, an adaptive requirement to eliminate this a bit like you know sickle cell anemia you know to deal with um malaria it's an adaptation uh, sort of a modification of red blood cells to deal with a disease situation in the environment it doesn't it's not happening you know just by accident there's a reason for it and other populations that seem to be a bit more robust seem to have better t-cell um you know, capability, especially some of the tribal populations that are eating more animal-based foods, um, are earthing themselves, getting enough vitamin D and getting enough of the nutrients that actually, like taurine from the animal foods that increase the, um, the you know, improve the strength of the immune system to produce um, a stronger T, um, you know, the T cell response to pathogens they're also in malaria type infested areas, but they don't get the disease and they don't have sickle cell. You know, it's more the agriculturalists because they had to adapt because they didn't have the protective stuff. But anyway, let's move on. So that's, and I said, I suspect that it's, yeah. and in other, and in others, there was none. So there was no requirement for us, you know, because it was like a vestigial trait. We didn't need to lose it because there was no pressure adaptive pressure to, to force us evolutionary pressure whatever you want to call it um so as it, so it remained simple as that and i do actually put a cautionary warning out to people because i think it's important um if people read the comment to be to be to understand this farmers should avoid giving fruit to cows and horses and you know circuses to elephants that they ha um, that, that have lost this gene and don't do well if fed fruit or, or fruit scraps. So if you've got any animals like these, you should not be feeding them fruit or fruit scraps because it's not good for them, okay? Because they've lost that gene. Even though they are plant eaters, they're not suited for this sort of stuff. Finally, our morphology is more like a carnivore than a plant for fermenter we no longer have a cecum to ferment plants or to ferment fruit but vestigial organs called an appendix you know that's what we've got so we don't have that capacity so the stuff is contraindicated um it's going to cause problems in our digestive tract and we know that when you eat too much fruit you get the runs you get diarrhea you get really bad um stomach cramps and stuff like that this stuff is contraindicated and we know to the epithelial cells in the gut it's actually quite harmful the fructose and the you know this sort of crap so in the past was seasonal. Unfortunately, nowadays people think that just because you can refrigerate the damn stuff, you can and get it all year round, that it's uh, it's indicated. Well, you know, well that's why the we have the health problems that we have, and the fatty livers and all that sort of stuff from the high fructose consumption. So I cover that, and then the final point that I make, plus the archaeological isotope data, indicates differently. The nitrogen fifteen and delta thirteen carbon data from the collagen of our paleo bones indicate that we have been super hyper carnivores. So super in the interglacial periods, like we are now, pre-agricultural interglacial periods and the past two interglacial periods and hyper carnivore in the glacial periods, which is the longest period of um, that our speciation actually had to endure. For most of our existence, and recently, the zinc data in the teeth of our ancestors also provides additional proof. It's sort of, you know, it really is a slam dunk on the isotope and zinc da um, data that's come out. So it says, this is a source of your nitrogen 15. This is your source 
um, these animals are, um, are the uh, are ruminants because you've got a high delta 13 carbon because they're eating C4 grasses. That's why the higher delta 13 carbon, you know, anybody that understands the science of this understands what I'm talking about. Um, those who are not informed need to go and learn if they want to validate what I'm saying. And pretty much the zinc stuff in the tooth enamel is now just slam dunking the whole issue and explaining it the way it should be. Then I cover the final part. I say those isotope numbers only change dramatically with the introduction of agriculture around 5,500 to 7,000 years ago in a number of regions of the world. Now, tillage started about in the Middle East about 5,500 years ago, 3,500 BC. Um, so that was when it started, and that's when you could say grain agriculture and all that really went on a high. Prior to that, it was a mixed bag of some domesticated animals, some domesticated um, plants, and some seasonal plants and stuff like that. It was a mixed bag, but once we got to about 3,500 BC, which is 5,500 years ago, that's when things really ramped up on the on the plant side in our diet and obviously when we look um, archaeologists when they look at those people their stature is shorter um, because they're getting low quality protein and a lot of other health problems emerge they've got these little white spots on their cranium which shows um, uh, you know deficiencies of iron and things like that so there are different definitely noticeable differences between paleolithic humans that are on species appropriate diets and those who basically have shifted and they're in 14 which is from plants eating plants the nitrogen 14 in their body goes up um which is quite clear that this you know where the source of the protein is coming from and they are showing the signs of um, protein deficiency and a whole lot of other micronutrient deficiencies and problems and health problems you know, and this isn't you I mean, even even people, if you go back 150 years ago, there were rickets issues and all sorts of health problems in the poorer people existed because of undernourishment. Now we're just overnourished with crap, but not um, that means with energy, food, energy, like food mass, it can be converted into energy or stored, but still we're, a, in terms of micronutrients, still the majority of the population is really very poorly served in many regards but anyway um then i conclude at the end so your opinion is invalid and not supported by the archaeological evidence or countless bones from around the world and that is really what it is for everyone that makes if you're going to put claim certain things you need to be basically provide proof to back it up really that is the the requirement Otherwise, you're really, you know, I don't care if people say, well, they send me an email or they send me uh, or they just post um, the 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 title, the actual title of uh, or they want to come onto one of my live streams, you know, send me an email and say, look, I'd like to debate. I'd like to debate this. We'll, we'll set up some rules. You know, three to five studies um, you can put forward. And we'll go through them and scrutinize them. Simple as that. I've got no problems in actually doing that with anyone. I think, you know, Bart and me and a number of others in the carnival community have always said we're willing to discuss a lot of these issues. You know, the reality is that a lot of people cop out for the simple reason that they don't have the evidence to support their argument. They put forward opinions, and that's all they are, but they can't back them up. I can back things up with genetics and all sorts of things, the reason why and adaptations and variations within carnival, non-carnival species in terms of all these sort of factors and many others, not only this sort of stuff, there's a lot of other stuff which I will be covering in future myths and fal falsehoods of veganism. That series will start up again probably later, probably early next year. I don't really have time at the moment to do any um, any of that but it will, uh, that series will come back it's still there is a playlist covering that and it will grow um with uh, with more elements in it 
Um, I will include this video in there because I think it um, it's well worth while well, because a lot of these arguments are always also put forward by vegans. It's not only by people that are on the poor Saladino um, modified whatever you um meat based and fruit and and uh, fruit based diet. Um, I don't know what you want to call it. You can call it the poor Saladino um, dietary approach. Um, there's a few other people that do do that. As I said, I've got no issue with people, what they want to eat and how they want to eat. That's their problem in that regard. But if they are making claims about anything when it comes to nutrition and dietary and stuff like that, or um, what is healthy and what isn't, you really need to you really need to evidence that, in, that stuff. Um, and as I said, I'm open to discussions and all that. For me, as a human, I've gone through a lot of these sort of things. I went through the paleo stage. I went through the low carb. I've been through all these sort of things, looked into them quite thoroughly, um, spent hours upon hours studying um, what is appropriate for the species and looked at a lot of this archaeological evidence. I have to thank people like Michael Eads um, for enlightening me about the um, the isotope data which I had no idea about. And I basically did download some data from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany. Um, some stuff had to be translated, but it was a bit of an insight into understanding uh, what they were finding from bones around the world. Uh, Germany has, a because of the 1930s, they had an extensive archaeological sort of uh, um good funding let's put it that way into archaeology and they went around the world picking up all sorts of things um and so they got good research which is really handy to look into and then there are other types of evidence when it comes to the expensive tissue hypothesis in terms of bigger brains you know and shrunken um digestive tracts which really limits us at a very low, um, you know, pH, so more acidic stomach, which is more what scavengers and, um, you know, scavenger type carnivores or carnivores um, would do. And it makes sense because if we're moving away from the chimps and we're, we're eating more and more out in the actual, you know, we're, we're pretty much going to adapt into becoming more sca scavengers and stuff like that. So there's that that sort of side of things as well. Um, so it makes sense that uh, these adaptations are quite old and it makes logical sense that, you know, those, because of the, the climate situation on the planet, the glacial periods, the long glacial periods, there wasn't much else to eat. Let's just be honest. I mean, even if, um, you know, when you've got kilometres of ice, over New York and places like that, and you've got, you know, frost all the way down to the tropics, there's not much plants that actually are growing. And even the animals like they do now in Canada and areas in, in Siberia and all that, what do they do? They dig with their um, with their sort of um, nose type thing or their mouth type area. They sort of dig and through the snow to get to the grass that's underneath. So it's these sort of things all vegetation that's popping out of the actual snow and the ice and that's how what they actually consume and if there is not much of that they will adapt to other things and we've seen a number of species that have adapted and you could see for instance the the bear where the bear is um sort of a more omnivorous in the in those sort of regions um where you're you're looking at uh, sort of uh, North America, Siberia, uh, Europe, parts of Europe, and even down down in, in towards the Mediterranean. I know there are some bears up in northern Greece. In those sort of areas, you do have um, those animals that are, that are adapted to a more omnivorous diet. But when you go all the way up to the Arctic, pretty much full blank carnivals those um uh, those polar bears and they'll rip humans apart and everything else they were quite big and quite powerful 
so they uh they can pull apart you know these big walruses and uh, these big um seals and whatever else so they're quite powerful in that regard so it's a very very you know certain adaptations but that's taken over a very very long period of time like us um and uh, we've developed a lot of different adaptations now you know maybe if we were considered continue to consume plants for another hundred thousand years certain adaptations will happen to us and we'll be able to probably tolerate them more i don't know what will happen to our intelligence our minds and all that going back based on on past history will probably de-evolve <laughs> into the sort of warlocks like in that um that's futuristic movie about the time machine if you remember the warlocks so yeah um things of that sort but what i'm saying is that when people put certain propositions forward they need to be able to back them up the archaeological evidence is quite clear our digestive tract is quite clear the you know the logic that expensive tissue hypothesis you know there's only you need energy dense and nutrient dense foods to be able to provide support for the brain and to reduce the amount of work that needs to be done through the digestive system the most suitable foods for that are animal based foods so our digestive tract our brain size expensive tissue hypothesis angle plus on the other side um the n15 data the archaeological data and the zinc data and all that pretty much nails at what we are suited for and all that that doesn't mean we can't consume plants and stuff like that but there are deleterious consequences for that fatty liver especially with fruit all year round and honey because it was only seasonal we know that animals use fructose to fatten up. Well known. This is in the literature. There are a number of animals like in the Amazon, like even fish will come up, swim up in when because twice uh, it, there are two seasons where um, the Amazon floods and these fish come up and actually eat uh, plants, fruit, and they go from something like this to something like this i'm not kidding you massive and then they get they dive into the deep water any other little fish and stuff like that and they shrink 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 because they use all their body fat and that they've actually built up from the fructose because fructose will convert to like alcohol will convert to you know fat you know we know the beer belly and all that sort of stuff so Pretty much that's what some of these animals use as a strategy. Other strategies can other there are some birds like um hummingbirds and other things that have adapted to be able to deal with a high level of fructose and deal with a high level of deuterium. They just have the ability, you know. Um things like uh, certain insects are adapted to deuterium, high deuterium foods. We know that uh, uh, things like the bees they will actually they actually have this vibration thing that they do with their wings to send out um like a echo type to to hit the actual pollen area that actually then re, um releases the sort of like the um it's a scent from a high deuterium when there's high deuterium isotopes which flow back through the air and are detected and it works out. Oh, this is very ripe because the more deuterium it has, because the the as the as the fruit ripens, it actually concentrates deuterium. Got it? That's what the plant does. It's, it uses a growth factor, so it concentrates deuterium, and that is why it's so attractive to these sort of animals and all that. But they are adapted to be able to deal with that. We were never adapted. And when we did have access, we had access for a limited period of time, seasonal, one to two. It was normally a month, maybe sometimes six um, weeks. That's about it. A very short window. And then everything just dropped to the ground and rotted. That was it until we found hmm, we could refrigerate this. We can use this method and that method to preserve things and use chemicals and whatever else. That's modern industry. 
but you can't justify consuming stuff just because modern industry now can provide it to you all year round. That's not logical. You know, we're not adapted to it. You can't argue that position. It's a it's an illogical argument. But you can argue that it we've consumed it um, you know, seasonally. And if some people consume it seasonally, I know that some carnivals do. They you know, some use berries um seasonally and a few other things. You know, that's their business. I got no oh, you know, the end of the day. But there's a difference between consuming it and there's a difference between trying to justify it and argue for it. That's two different things. And so when people say, oh, it doesn't this person consume berries? Yes, they do. Um, I don't. I don't consume any fruit. But that's a personal decision of mine not to consume any fruit. But others that do, my younger sister still does. She does sort of a carnival on and off. But she still, even when she's doing carnival, she consumes some blueberries and stuff like that. You know, I mean, yes, I'll put her in the carny jail for violations of consumption of fructose. How dare she? Anyway, I'll actually send this video to her so she's going to get a laugh. She probably will poke fun at me as well. That's what sisters do. You should know that. Yeah, so pretty much... It's a nonsense argument to try to justify um, fructose. So he's a supporter of Paul Saladino's, but you know, I suspect Paul's been. I haven't watched any these recent stuff. I'm not really interested to be personally, you know. And had he not left this comment, I wouldn't have even bothered. But pretty much, Paul is putting out all this poison in terms of arguments to try and justify him guzzling down now, probably, I think Bart said last time, it was 400 grams of sugar. I mean, Paul, really? 400 grams of high deuterium crap. Bravo. Bravo, mate. Doing well. It actually looks, have you checked this off in the mirror recently and compared two years ago, your photos and all that? I think you'd be shocked, mate, because I've seen a recent photo that some somebody showed me, and and I think even Bart um, showed it uh, recently as well, and it didn't look good. It looked really poor. You know, talk about cognitive dissident. You know, he's just so he's you know, and a lot of them actually I've noticed recently some some of the carnivals I've gone for lean meats and fruit for their energy, so. Give away the low deuterium, high quality animal fat as a source for structural material and ATP production for energy. Low deuterium stuff and take and consume the highest deuterium source of uh, carbohydrate based mass energy. All I can do is just shake my head. It's ridiculous. Anyway, that's pretty much it um, on that point. Yes, you frugivores out there uh, still love you as an Orthodox Christian. I hope you find your way. Um, away from your contraindicated ways. Anyway, see yous.